Hi, everybody, and welcome to How Niantic Switch Pokemon Go to Use in Boy. My name is Anna Kobi, and I'm a Server Core Infrastructure Tech Lead at Niantic. Who are we? Niantic is a leading AR technology company focused on exploring new applications for advanced hardware, wearable devices in particular, that marry the digital world and the physical world. Our mission is based on three key product principles, exploration and discovery of new places, exercise, and real-world social interactions with other people. This mission has been our compass. It's paved the way for our consumer AR games, Ingress, Pokemon Go, Harry Potter. And that's what we are arguably best known for. But we're a lot, a whole lot more than that. Underpinning these games is a powerful technology platform, the Niantic Real World Platform, which we've been investing in and evolving from the very beginning. Niantic Real World Platform also supports social features, mapping, and advanced AR, all the components needed to develop and publish a real world AR game. As our platform grew to offer additional components and new games were published, we needed to adjust infrastructure to support the new workloads and complexity. Let's review our journey. Our journey took two parallel routes, one for unifying our service to service connectivity and the other to simplify and support our edge proxy. Let me start with a simpler one, how we unified our service to service connectivity and secured our backend services. In the beginning, our configuration was simple. Nginx deploys our edge proxy routing traffic to the game servers. But as new services were developed and deployed, different routing configurations were created and defined by the, new dev, by the dev teams. Most connections were passing through the front door using regional IPs, hoping not to hit the public internet. Others were using external services or infrastructure like VPC peering we still required a gateway to be defined in the cluster. And we even had services sending data to Dataflow to update the game's data. This created several problems that we needed to address. This problem included the need for developers to add security and instrumentation to code, our inability to configure routes dynamically, lack of observability and alerting if instrumentation wasn't added to code, are the services indeed connected? And lastly, the need for new SREs joining the team to learn all these technologies, but have very little control over them, resulting in maintenance mode. As a result, we focused our efforts in finding a solution that will isolate the connectivity configuration from the application and will, en will enable us to address the rest of the issues. We decided to adopt Envoy plus Fire for our cross GCP's communication. The flexibility provided by this pair enabled us to support our different models from duplex mode to either pull or push, add unified security with federation for games and services. By creating a pool of gateways, we were also able to shift those services from using the edge proxy to using their dedicated more secure endpoints. So we named our new project Service Gateway, mainly to dis distinguish it from Service Mesh that became a synonym for ISDIO in the company, caused a lot of confusion. What we loved about this approach was that there was no need for application code changes and we only had to do cleanup. In addition, the solution was cloud native and ensure high availability. We used Gradle scripts with Helm charts to deploy and configure in Vore Inspire. And our measure performance was one milliseconds of edit latency with max measure load of 20,000 requests per second per one virtual CPU, which was pretty good. One question you're probably wondering about was why we didn't adopt service mesh implementation for orchestration and management for the mesh? In one word, maturity. When looking at CMCF landscape map under service mesh, these are the graduated projects. These are the incubating projects, but most of the projects are still in sandbag stage or not yet added to the map. When we started our journey, we investigated using ISTIO, but decided to hold off for now due to complex configuration and breaking changes between versions. Looking at our next steps, 
With a future of increasing numbers of backend services and games, it is obvious for us that we will need to find a solution for orchestration and management at scale. What we liked about shifting to Envoy was that the most of the tools under development were using Envoy as the proxy, so migrating to them should be an incremental step. And we still had the option of using XDS in the meantime as our management tool. Let's review now our more interesting journey with Envoy as an edge proxy. I mentioned before that our game cluster de deployment is simple, but while the deployment is simple, there were several things we wanted to address. Improving user experience when scaling was one of the goals, and I will elaborate more about what this covers and why in a minute. But besides this issue, we also wanted to improve our monitoring and alerts, unify as much as possible our tools and data plane, and lastly support the company's goal in enabling external developers to create new games without exposing our IP. I would like to focus for a moment on the goal of improving user experience when scaling, mainly because this part of our, our architecture caused us some trouble. Here, the big question, of course, is why scaling created bad user experience? The problem lies in the proxy configuration and config map limitations. Our proxy configuration is tied very much into our IP. For every incoming request, the proxy is checking if the request URL has a prefix of an opaque ID. If one is found, the proxy matches that ID to a game server, removes the prefix, and routes the request accordingly. Requests without ID are round robin between the available game servers. We refer to this specific part of the configuration as the catch-all. In addition, our protocol supports HTTP and WebSockets requests. As a result, our configuration file can't fit into a Kubernetes config map and is deployed inside the proxy image. This problem is true for Nginx and Envoy. Looking on the process of scaling up, we first increase the number of game servers replica. When all instances are up and healthy, we update the configuration of the routes, leaving the catch all the same. This creating a new image and update the deployment. This step can be disruptive to clients that are currently connected through WebSockets or pending a response from the server. When all pods are updated and healthy, we update the backend with the number of available game servers and update again the proxy configuration, creating a second wave of disruptions. Scaling down process is very similar, only in reverse order. Well, XDS to the rescue. Using a custom XDS operator, we were able to scale up and down the clusters without the need to restart or redeploy them. The operator receives the requested cluster size through a Kubernetes custom resource, update the configuration, and pass it to Envoy. We are currently in the process of deploying this new operator. Our next steps after verifying the operator is stable and working as expected will be to integrate it with the game server existing drain feature for a seamless scale experience. This overview our new deployment. After verifying we can achieve our goals using Envoy, we started to plan and execute the migration from Nginx to Envoy. Our high-level plan included running load testing to verify performance and provisioning of Envoy, test the migration scenario, run books and rollback in the load test environment, deploy the new Envoy instances, and shift traffic from Nginx to Envoy. Sounds easy, right? We started with load testing using a Pokemon Go load testing setup and runners. We used the latest Envoy version, which was 1.12.2, and started with a basic environment of X game servers, X caching services, one proxy, and a load of hundreds of thousands of requests per second. The result looks great, except some pesky 503 errors that surfaced from time to time. We had to make a couple of changes to our production environment to be able to shift the traffic from engines to Envoy. The first change was to separate the, traf the public traffic from the backend services I mentioned before. Since we didn't onboard the service gateway yet, we took the approach of simply duplicating the engine's configuration and creating a dedicated pool for them. We then had to replace the existing external load balancer service with a node port with external traffic policy set to local instead of cluster. 
This allowed us to control the traffic and monitor both proxy pools while serving on the same port, which is a GCLP limitation. We also switched from old replication controller to a deployment object, which gave us an opportunity to do a simplified dry run of the traffic shift. Lastly, we switched from utilization-based load balancing to COM-based load balancing due to difference in resources between Nginx and Envoy. We copied the already prepared Grafana dashboards and created a new pool for the Envoy fleet. One of the features we couldn't find a replacement for, by the way, is the IP deny list, and we had to replace it with a Google Cloud Armor. If there is an existing Envoy filter that provides this functionality, we would love to hear about it, but if not, we will probably write a custom filter to provide this functionality. We're becoming very good in writing those. Well, the big day arrived, and we started shifting the traffic from Nginx to Envoy. Well, we started, started deploying. The traffic shift plan was to first increase the number of Envoy replicas in the pool. When reaching full capacity, decrease the number of Nginx replica until hitting zero. We started with deploying a single Envoy instance. It was there for a couple of minutes when we started seeing an increase in five or three hours, and then it crashed. We immediately scaled down to zero. This is just a short version, but after several days of investigations and digging up in Envoy and GCLP documentation, we found the following results. The main reason for the Envoy crash was because we were hitting it with 20 times the expected load. And even more, it was already deployed on a pod with limited resources, which might have been a contributor factor, but unfortunately, after correcting the traffic distribution to 2,000 requests per second, we never encountered this problem again. The 503 errors were easier to understand but harder to find as they were a result of a discrepancy in the timeout for idle connections causing GCLB to return 503s for connections that were terminated by Envoy. Fixing this part decreased the 503s errors to a normal level. As it usually happens, we were ready for second try only two weeks later. We fixed the configuration, scaled it up to one instance, and started monitoring the service. It was happily running for a day with no problems, so we decided we were ready for the next step. And scale it up to two Envoy instances, and we entered a new era of multi-Envoy instances in production. Over the next two weeks, we slowly, slowly scaled up the Envoy fleet from 2 to 5, from 5 to 50%, and so on until we hit 100%. When hitting 100% of Envoy deployments, and after verifying all is OK, or at least that's what we thought, we started scaling down the Nginx fleet. In parallel to this migration, we had new features and services also added to the environment, creating problems of their own. So when problems started hitting us, we didn't recognize what is the source of them. Everything was looking good, except occasional 503 errors. And we also noticed an increase in NX domains received from KubeDNS that started when we deployed Envoy. We had no success tuning KubeDNS and had little information to understand the source of the problem. Like any other team, we were busy. And with little information or access, this turned to be the status quo for four months until GoFaced arrived. <laughs> Uh, if you're not aware, GoFest is our biggest event of the year. When starting to scale the number of game servers in preparation for the event, we started receiving reports of an increase in 503 errors. This happened immediately after deploying Envoy images with the new configuration. If you remember step two in the scale-up scenario, that was before uh, we even tried to scale Envoy. But Hoping this might be related to load, we increased the Envoy fleet size. We didn't know that this actually made things worse. We also started noticing an increase in player complaints on the down detector. We investigated bad configuration, wrong health check, everything, but found no clue except an interesting decrease in KubeDNS errors. That part confused us more, but then we found a hint. And just a reminder, our deployed Envoy version was 1.12.2, and this was fixed only in 1.14. So given the timeline and the importance of GoFest, the comp 
to the company, Nginx was deployed to replace Envoy and go fast past with no issues from the Edge proxy. And we went back to our Lotus environment to try and figure out how to solve this problem. Back to our Lotus environment, we started with reconfiguring it to match production. We scaled it up to match one tenth of production and configured to have X10 services pointing to the game servers in hope to recreate the conditions that caused the problem we saw in production. It was easy. We got the NS errors already when hitting 1 30th of the production environment. At that point, I already knew what was the problem, and maybe some of you are already guessing it. It was our configuration that caused the load in DNS queries. Our stateful backend configuration was causing the proxies to query kube DNS four times for each game server. Now multiply that by the number of proxies, add to that the number of game servers, and the number becomes too high. The solution we tested was Google Cloud new DNS caching operator, which made the errors disappear completely, but will require an update to the JKE version. So my personal learnings are stop ignoring intermittent error, test in production-like environment instead of a low test environment, continue evolving the sh traffic shift scenario to support future software and infrastructure upgrade. Just a reminder, we will need to upgrade our JKE version. One last part of Envoy I would like to talk about is our work to extend of extending Envoy, mainly to provide external developers access to our platform without exposing our IP. Unfortunately, I can't share a lot about this work. I can tell you that included request validation for HTTP and WebSockets requests shifting the responsibility to block this traffic already in the proxy. It also manipulates the incoming traffic based on the received message and provides us with additional metrics related to the games. Part of this includes a WebSocket custom filter that we wonder if it shouldn't be part of the platform, even for the purpose of upgrading it to a gRPC at the proxy. And this is truly how our deployment looks like. I would like to summarize this talk with a wine boy slide. Well, we chose Envoy for the better observability and monitoring, the service to service proxy, the configuration, the better scale experience with XDS, and finally, the extendability. Thank you for listening. And I would like to thank everyone in Niantic that helped me in this work. And for those of you that find this interesting and would like to learn more, we're hiring feel free to reach to me and check out our career website. Thank you, and I will be very happy to answer now any question you might have. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you hear me and see me. Um, and I will be very happy to answer any of your questions that were in the uh, chat. Um, so uh, first question, did we observe any issues when moving from Nginx to Envoy in terms of how the downstream connections are maintained by Nginx versus Envoy? And I actually asked here um, continuing questions regarding uh, was it something specific? So um, as, as Srinida, Srinidhi uh, mentioned, we have seen an issue where Envoy retains high throughput connections constantly. Whereas Nginx releases them periodically, did you see such issue during your migration? Well, uh, we didn't see this as an issue. Um, this was part of the behavior we already know, knew that is part of Envoy. Um, as I mentioned, the main difference that we had between Envoy and Nginx was actually around the DNS um, and the DNS querying. Nginx are not um, querying the DNS in such uh, so frequently, which was actually um, made us had some made us do some work problems in our environments. With and with Envoy, we can now uh, remove them. But um, we actually um, the only issue that we had was with the number of DNS cores that we had. Um, Second question was, um, can you elaborate on switching from utilization-based load balancing to count-based load balancing? Does count-based load balancing refers to a number of incoming requests? Um, so I forward this question to our SREs um, and um, part of our team that is also was working on that. Um, I, I believe this is a GCLB uh, 
property, but I might be wrong here. And um, it, we were mainly um, we were mainly just looking on yes, uh, the incoming requests. So ensure that they are being um, correctly um, load balanced um, between the different envoy instances of the backend services. And um, Thank you for the um, IP deny list. We will definitely look into that. I think we looked at that in the past, but if you notice from the presentation, we started our journey a year ago uh, when it was Envoy 12 and uh, 112, and it was um, Envoy evolved a lot since then. There are a lot of new things that we are using. Um, so let me get back. Um, For another questions, so I get a lot of uh, feedback here around what uh, should we look for the IP uh, deny. Um, thank you. I'll definitely look into them. It's really interesting. I heard the R back can help with that. Um, Well, uh, Rubens, if you'll tell me which slide, maybe I can share uh, the presentation, but I think everything will be online uh, soon. And you are always welcome to uh, contact me through the Slack. I'm on the Envoy Slack channels um, or through uh, LinkedIn or my email. And thank you, everybody. Um, somebody asked about the control plane and I missed the question. So we are using a control plane. Um, that was uh, one of our moves to make the scale better. Um, we are actually now going um, to start deploying it everywhere we have in book. Um, it's definitely going to improve our scale uh, experience. And by the way, for the control plane, we're using, of course, LDS and CDS um, because our Listeners, uh, path matchings, and clusters um, are really coupled into one to one. Well, we are no longer using Nginx itself um, in most of our uh, places. And the one that we are using, I believe we're using the open source one. I'm very happy um, to hear and help, um, and we um, we are very happy to share from our experience. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, by the way, uh, we did have to write a custom filter for uh, WebSockets, which was a very uh, interesting experience, uh, actually. And uh, we are probably um, will be um, publishing it in a couple of months. We need to pass the legal process for that. Um, so anybody, everybody will be able to use it. So um, the number of RPS per core on our Envoy, um, I do have it somewhere, but I don't really remember. Um, and I don't want just to throw numbers. So uh, Mikhail, if you can um, just contact me through Stack, I will be very happy to answer that. And um, yeah, thank you everybody. Uh, if there are any more questions, we have a couple more minutes, but um, if not, then you have uh, six minutes for refreshing. Thank you. Nginx features that we could not replace with Envoy was the IP denial list. That was mainly it. We actually uh, gained a lot of uh, things moving to Envoy. Um, and uh, we, uh, we we really enjoyed doing this mode. So no, actually, it was the other way around, except the uh, deny list, which you, I believe you will find a solution very fast. Thank you. Bye.